Welcome. My name is Jared Smith. I'm an architect on the NGFW team working on uh, NGFW management. And I'm here with Veer, who's on the DevNet team. And he'll be taking us through the FMC REST API, which came out in 6.1. And he'll talk us through how you can get started using that REST API. So Veer, why don't you get us started here? Thank you, Jared. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christian Veer. I'm with Cisco. Uh, Cisco DevNet, I'm developer evangelist who focuses on uh, Cisco security technologies. So I'm really excited to talk about FMC API. It's been out since version 6.1. We recently released 6.2.3, where we have added more features to this API. So let's get started on, on our API journey. And in this, basically, I, what I will cover, it, before I get started, actually, this is more important is that in, in case you are following along um, at home uh, or at your office uh, on this video, you should have these tools downloaded. So um, one of the important thing, I think very easy to actually uh, uh, program is, is Python. So you should have a Python there. Our API Explorer tool, which I will cover a little bit, actually can generate a lot of Python code which you can use. Uh, so if you're having Python is good. Um, another thing is is very important tool I think a lot of people use, or maybe you are already using it, is Postman. Uh, Postman is a tool which you can actually uh, go explore uh, API using using it. So that's a good tool to have in your um, in your um, machine to be installed. The if you don't have these tools, one of the important tools which we have is just requires browser, and our engineering team developed this. I'm very proud of that. And this tool is very powerful. Uh, you can actually um, explore uh, what API we is, uh, features are turned on, what resources are available, what data model looks like, and you can actually have a small uh, play area where you can actually play with the real calls. Um, just be aware, don't do that on production system. You can either do it on um, your uh, sandboxes in your own workspace, or you can actually go to uh, DevNet sandboxes and, and play with that there, which is available 24-7. So moving along, um, this is how the DevNet sandbox setup looks like. And just in case, if you went to developers.cisco.com and you reserved a sandbox for yourself, um, you actually, this is how this, the setup looks like. So what, what's going on here, this is what, where you are. Probably you are writing some, um, uh, some uh, Python script here, or you are using web browser to browse an API explorer, or, or, or just connecting to your UI, FMC UI, which you are very well aware of. Um, and then what we have, we have a simple FMC running here, and that FMC has a few um, uh, virtual NGFWs, and so these are NGFWV. This is actually also a virtual image which is running there, and then you have some firepower devices as well. So, so this is how your setup would look like if you reserved the sandbox on DevNet, and this is what I'm going to use in the demo today, um, so this setup. We have one quick question. Can, can the REST API control the configuration of both the next gen firewall and the firepower devices? Yes, Just, that's so we correct. Make that clear? Yes. Okay. We can. So, moving along, um, this is what I'm going to actually cover today. So, first, um, I'm going to cover enabling REST API on FMC UI. Um, F, generally, it, on your, when you start using REST API, I think it's a good idea to go to your FMC UI and make sure that it's enabled, it's turned on. Uh, by default, it's turned on, but it's always a good idea to make sure it's on. Um, then um, we're going to explore a little bit with FMC uh, API Explorer, like what, what features it has and, and what, how can it help us to get started. I'm going to cover this later on, so I'll come back to it. So let's get started. So first I'm going to do is I'm going to launch the browser here. Um, you guys are very well aware of this UI. You've been using it for a while. This is very good. It has a nice dashboard. This is a very powerful UI. Um, so one thing you're probably either already aware of, or if you have not seen FMC UI, you probably noticed this not secure and this HTTPS crossed off. Generally, this is happening because on my setup, I, I have self-signed certificate. Actually, um, FMC accepts your custom certificate. So if you have 
custom certificates, feel free to upload them and all these errors will go away. In my case, it's there. It doesn't mean that it's not secure. So here, what I will do is I will go to the system. Um, let me clear my marker. And I'll go to the system. Go to my system. Configuration. When I go to the configuration, there will be a bunch of uh, stuff which will get displayed here. If you notice, um, this is the place where you can actually press and upload your uh, custom certificates, and all these messages will go away, which you see up there. But for us, what we are looking at is the API preferences. So this is the area where you will go and press to um, get uh, API pre preferences loaded. So it looks like I'm, I'm going to click this, and once I click this, uh, I should have um, a, a, a checkbox which will come up here where I can quickly check whether it is enabled or not. So you guys see there, it's already enabled. I don't need to do anything over here. And this actually sets me up that now I'm ready to use API Explorer. So the next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch another tab here. And I will just quickly type in the URL. Um, Uh, and looks like it is already showed up here. Um, this will launch the UI, but I would like to go to the API slash API Explorer. And it has prompted me to um, enter my credentials. So I'm going to enter my credentials. Um, once I enter my credentials, the, the, the UI will get rendered here. And this, is the, this will bring up the API Explorer. So I will quickly clear this. So this is a nice um, console you see. The important thing to notice here, it gives you the version number here. So it's currently running 6.2.3. All these tabs is, is, is the features which are actually being supported. Um, so you would see it's it's quite rich. Um, there is um, uh, some TID, Cisco Threat Intelligence features, which goes under intelligence. And we have all the policy and object and uh, configuration and management features, which are here. So this is a good place where this area, which you see, is the area we generally call uh, um, um, a play area. So if I, if I go quickly onto uh, an object, um, so you see here, it actually shows uh, different methods supported on different objects. So uh, for example, all these methods which we're seeing, like for example, if you go to host, the method which is supported is, is get, post, put, delete. Post is actually a method which um, uh, uh, generally creates a new object. Put is actually where you can um, create, update an object, delete, you delete object. These are standard uh, REST methods. So here in this play area, you see it's automatically, when I said get, it automatically populated this. If I press the get, it actually goes and get the response back from the server. Um, so this is, this is a great way to explore what actually uh, the host looks like. Another great feature, I think, which team has worked hard on is this thing which you executed in the REST, actually it can generate that code for you. So you see um, uh, it has generated a Python code of what actually happened here. So I'm going to quickly um, switch back. Uh, so this is uh, my quick demo of API Explorer and how do you enable the API. Now we're going we're gonna to go and do some gets our hands dirty because we're going to add a device to FMC. And this can be now achieved using API. So first thing I'm going to do, it's a two-step process when you add device to FMC. And I think most of you are already aware of it. First, you have to go on device and let device know where the manager is or who the manager is. And then on the FMC, you, you um, actually add the device. So you've been doing that with UI. We're going to try and do that using API. So first thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch simple SSH client. And I'm going to go on the client over here. And you see um, I am on the console. I'm locked in. I'm on the console. All I'm going to do here is um, uh, first I'm going to check whether I have any managers already 
um, assigned. So because that's a, a good way to start, because you should not have any manager configured. Otherwise, you will get some error. So I have no managers configured. So I will say uh, configure. So how, about how long does it take to add a manager? Like if, when you're typically waiting and you enter on the console, does it take take a minute, a couple of minutes for it to? Yeah, it takes. It. It's, it takes. I mean, most of people are already aware of it, so I'm gonna just quickly type uh, uh, twenty dot zero dot uh, three, which is the IP of my uh, uh, manager, and. It also requires uh, a shared secret between manager and uh, the device. So I'm going to give it some shared secret. Uh, and I will just try to add it. Um, this, as it executes, it actually will come back with the, uh, with the status that um, it has accepted it. And once it has accepted it, I can then go to the API Explorer and, 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 and start adding that in the API Explorer. I think so, one, one of the strong points with this, I believe, is since it tries to connect both ways when it does this initial connection, I mean, you can even traverse NAT boundaries. Correct. If, if you have one and it can only talk one way. Correct, so that's that, correct. That's one of the- That's correct, guys. And, and so right now, if I show, uh, show managers, um, and that will give me the status of, uh, status of what's going on here. So this will this will probably give me that registration is pending. That means on on the device side we are we are doing pretty good. So uh, over here, what you what I meant was this is pending. This is the the manager it's going to look for, and the status is currently uh, pending, right? So let's clear, and let's go on um, uh, our API Explorer because we can use API Explorer to to execute these uh, API REST commands. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for device. In the device, we have what we call the device records. We're going to go there, and we're going to use the post method here, because it's a new device which we're going to create. So we look at the examples. There are examples here. And this is a sample request data you need to fill in. and. Everything is pre-populated, so you actually can create your payload really quickly for this post, post method. So what I'm going to do is just go on this side and try to copy this, um, this payload. And you see there are some certain fields here which I need to uh, provide. And what I will be doing is on, I will be taking it to the play area and pasting it there. So as I scroll it, um, over here, I have name, and so name would be something which I would like to give to this. Um, and then the host name is actually uh, is the IP address of the actual device. Um, I'm not going to use, it's not natted, so I'm just going to get rid of that. That's a useless thing for me right now. This is the registration key where, which I already know, which I gave it to my device. So this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to make these changes over here. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is give a, 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 a name, a unique name. So I'm going to call it like um, waiter. And um, I'm going to change this host name. And I'm going to give the IP address of my, um, my sensor, or my NGFW, which is 10.1.20.0.2. This NAT ID is not required, so I'm going to just get rid of it. The registration key, I think, if I remember, was SFO123. Um, so I'm going to quickly change that to 123. And I think pretty much that sets me up uh, 
that sets me up actually. And uh, one more thing I just want to mention to uh, uh, folks, I think most of the folks are probably already know it, that when you are adding a device, when you add a device, you need to have some policy in place. So in, in, in my case, I have some policy which is there, and I, I actually didn't know what policy is there right now. So um, I have to go and find that policy. So this is where... Um, so in, uh, in that case, you need the policy UUID that you yeah. have to go fetch ahead yes. of time? So yes. So this is something which we need to do ahead of time is that let's, let's do this. This is something which I did not do here. Um, first thing we should do is we should go back to the policy. And you see here, you have policies. So you get a policy. You, pr you do a get on the policy. And looks like um, uh, we have only one policy here which is a default policy. So I'm going to actually just copy this and keep it handy with me. Um, so this is, uh, this is important because this ID is required to provide. In, another input needs to be provided when I register a device. So I'm going to copy this, keep it with me, and I'm going to go back to the devices and the post. So here, I'm going to, again, just uh, grab that um, ID over here. And I'm going to copy. I'm going to copy this. Here, I'm going to copy, quickly copy this. And so here, um, where I'm going to actually use this ID, first thing I'm going to populate is that this is a very important step. And um, we should never forget that we, you cannot add a device without a policy. So I'm going to quickly take that and make sure that I provide that UUID here, the policy I want this to be attached to this device. So I added that. That's the most important step. Um, I'm going to quickly go and change the name which I used before. I'm going to call it waiter, whose name is, uh, I think we already by heart by now, 1.20.0.2. Uh, uh, and get rid of this white space. Uh, and NAT ID is not required because um, this device is not behind the NAT. We're going to go get rid of that. Um, we're going to actually add uh, the, the shared secret, which is SFO23123. Two, three. Two, three. Everything else, I think, looks pretty good. So in, in your example there, you had all, I believe all the license types are enabled. Yes, that is also important uh, uh, that um, whatever licenses you have, you make sure they are enabled. In my case, I have all all of them enabled. Another another quick thing you need to do when you're adding device, and I, and, and I thank Jared for bringing this up, is that in the UI, actually, you go and make sure that. Um, um, so let me quickly actually run this post and see how it goes. Looks like it's successful. So one thing happens is here, and uh, is, is that it has provided you an ID. So what happens is that because when we register a device, it takes a time. Uh, it takes around three to five minutes. And when we are registering that device, w there is no, because REST is a stateless, there is no way for you to find out whether registration actually happened or not. So if you have written a script, the script cannot find out whether registration has happened or not. So one thing you can do is actually you can take the ID of this task, which is here, and you can actually copy this ID. And then you can actually go to this, uh, this area, which is this is. And this is the URL. So if you are writing code, you will be going on this URL. So this is the URL. And on this URL, you can actually do a get. Right? So when you do a get, so it, it, it actually is going to, when you do a get, it actually is going to ask you the UUID of the request you want to do status on. So let's say if you have done a deployment job or you are adding a device, you can actually provide that. Uh, that you, that's unique ID, and, and if you do a get, it will get you a response back. And in that response, it says that it's, it's actually running. So it's uh, over here. If you look at it, it's actually showing that device registration is the task. 
currently it is running. So it's very important that um, that you 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 can you can actually write code to keep checking on that status. Another thing, uh, important thing in the meantime, when the registration is going on, I will try to switch back to uh, the UI, and I I thank Jared for for bringing it up. Is um, that is another thing is important here is that if we go on licenses, uh, and he's talked about licenses, so I just want to quickly bring up. Um, is that you should have smart licenses enabled. If they are not enabled, then you won't be able to um, actually register an uh, NGFW device. So, so that's very important over here. That's another thing, and I, the reason I kept it towards the end so that it sticks, because this is an important step which you should remember while adding devices. Even if you are adding devices using UI, you have to go through that step. So it's not something unique you have to do for the API. Maybe you are already doing this, you're already aware of it. Right, so I'm hoping that um, if we, um, one of the tasks it's currently running is that you, you could see this is another way to check whether your API calls are successful or not. The another way to check it is that you can go to the UI and just in case you are testing it, this is a good way to test. It can give you a status that it has completed 50%, it has been running from a minute 30 seconds, and, um, and another um, um, uh, good uh, thing is that you can actually go to device. So if I close this, um, and if I go back to devices, uh, you could see the waiter should start appearing. Um, and looks like what we tried to do with the API actually happened. So I just want to quickly um, switch back um, to our um, uh, agenda slide here. So we covered so far uh, enabling uh, REST API on FMC UI. We explored the API Explorer. We saw how powerful it is. We have used it to actually um, add a device, um, which actually made API calls to add a device. And one thing I just want to reiterate here is that API Explorer is not replacing uh, the, the beautiful UI. It is just a tool to play with the API. And it does modify production systems, so be very careful. If you are, you should not manipulate using that any production system. So if you are trying out API, it's good to set up a, a small lab, or you can go to developers.cisco.com and you can use our sandbox and you can play with the API and API Explorer over there. So quick, quick like yes. note, note there. So just to, to expand on the use case that you had there of adding a device. So if I had a script and I had 20 devices I need to deploy, I, I guess I could write a script to go add those 20 devices and then go, I mean, I, you'd still have to run the command on the device like you did yeah. to go add the key there, but you could you could take away the pain of going through the UI 20 times Absolutely. and just write a script that would do this kind of repeated process for you to, to save time and automate things. Yes, and, and that's that's the way, that's the power of it, so you can automate, uh, or you have to do that on multiple FMC, so if you're running three, four FMC and yeah. you're adding devices, you can do exactly the same thing. It's much easier that way. Another thing um, uh, you should remember is, and that's where the second way to the next topic is that the API Explorer is doing a lot of um, API authentication magic underneath, under the covers. Uh, what your FMC REST API uses token-based uh, authentication scheme. Uh, it's a custom header-based token. So what API Explorer does that once you log in, it does a lot of stuff for you under the covers which you didn't have to do when we added the device. So what I want quickly cover now, and it is very important if you're writing your own custom scripts or you're playing with Postman and you want to get started, this is the first wall you're gonna hit. And, and that's why I have this top topic, next topic is that, hey, if you're not using API Explorer, how do I get token? and get going executing those methods. So let's quickly cover that. So for that, I'm going to use Postman because that's the tool everyone uses. It's very, um, very, very powerful tool. And so what we can do um, is I'm going to just start the Postman here. So over here, what you see is this is the URL um, which FMC has. So this is, you could see it's self-explanatory because it it says it's generate token, so the sole purpose of this uh, endpoint is to generate token. And the method which you will be using will be the post method, so if you use get method or any method, you will get an error message saying that uh, we don't support 
uh, uh, this endpoint doesn't support any other method than post. So in case you use the wrong method, our error messages will inform you to use the right method. So um, one thing you have to be careful about is that when you're choosing the authorization type for the first time, uh, when you have to go get token, make sure that your type of authorization, and let me uh, clear this so it's clear, the type of authorization is basic auth. So definitely keep that in mind. This is a, 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 a you can choose different. This is a drop down uh, menu. You can choose different uh, schemes. So in that, uh, choose basic authentication. And here you will put on your uh, credentials, your whatever um, user you have created in uh, to, for um, API, or you are using some. Uh, uh, credentials which are already been issued to you by your administrator, that credentials you will use. And what you will do is just, um, it's very simple, Postman, this is a simple UI. And um, you can just press send. And when you press send, it actually goes and communicates um, to, the, to the server in the back end. And what happened here is actually um, it got 204. So um, if I grab the marker, in REST world, anything with 200 message means it's something good happened. Uh, generally, that is a success. So we got 204. And if you see, um, uh, body will be empty here. So don't get disappointed that, eh, I don't know what happened here. But what actually happened is because most of the, uh, the, the meat is in the headers. So if I scroll down, um, so you should see a few of these. Um, there's the auth token, token right? yeah. So here, if I scroll down, um, here is what we are looking for. So what happened is that there are a bunch of, um, what we do is that in the HTTP headers, we put um, that access token. So over here, you have the, the access token, and then the, this is the refresh token. And refresh token can be used to refresh your access token. The time to live for access token is around um, 30, 30 minutes, and refresh token is around uh, an hour or so. So this is for security purposes. Uh, your token should expire. That's one of the good security practices. And so hence, um, this, is, this is the token which you will probably copy and, and paste in your subsequent request if you want to do a get, post, or anything in there. So Veer, yes, one, one quick question yes. for you. If Does the self-signed certificate cause me to have to do any extra setup in Postman to make that work properly? Good point, uh, Jared. So this is uh, another thing you might hit problems that if, um, if I go to, um, uh, if I go, I have to move this a little on the side. If I go to the settings, sometimes what happens is if the self-signed certificate is there, what happens is that you probably have to make sure that SSL verification is off. Because by default, Postman has SSL certificate turned on. So if, you, if you're opening for a Postman for the first time, you would see this like this. And this generally means when, this generally will, behave a little differently when we send the message. And we can look at it. Um, let me close this window. And now if I send the same request back, uh, most likely I will get an error because a postman cannot, you see, could not get any response. So um, this actually um, is the reason this happened is that um, it actually gives you these. Um, so one of the reason it is happening is that self-signed SSL certificates are being blocked. So the only way to, you can fix this is actually you go um, and modify your settings and turn this off. And once you turn this SSL certificate variation off and you execute the same request, uh, probably it will go through and we will get our 200 uh, requests back. So. The response we got back is 200. That means it's looking good. We got our headers, which we were looking for. So please keep that in mind. And Jared, thanks for bringing that up. That's a very important point if you're starting from scratch. So I hope I helped you guys to get started on FMC REST API. We actually covered the API Explorer. I'm extremely proud of our engineering team for creating such amazing tool, which helped uh, get started really quickly. 
The second thing which we covered is adding a device using API Explorer. We used API Explorer. You can use Postman or you can write your own script to add device. So the adding devices using API is possible. Uh, remember that it's, it's a, it's a multi-step process. You have to make sure that device knows about the manager. And then on the manager, you should have a, a, a policy which you have to attach uh, when you are actually configuring the device. And I think most likely on UIs, you have already done that. You have to follow exact same thing on, um, on using APIs. And the last, what we covered is the token uh, authentication scheme. How, how can we get token if we are writing script or we are using Postman? How can we actually generate token and use token? So hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Jared, do you have any more questions for me? So, Vera, I think, I think that was great. And I think it really goes to show the power of the API, what the API can do, especially in either a multi-FMC kind of use case or just I need to add a bunch of devices to my FMC. I, I mean, it can really help make those tasks easier. And even beyond what, we, 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 what we've shown here, there's so many other APIs that can do things for you. And to learn more about this, please go, go check DevNet, use the sandboxes, and continue learning. And thank you very much. We appreciate you watching. Thank you.